hope you found that completely inspiring, as inspiring as I found that. And thank you very much to National Geographic for giving us the permission to screen that very important film. And also to give us the stories of those women, some of which I'm sure you recognize, and some you're probably seeing for the first time. And all of these stories combine to chart a new, more inclusive path forward. And so now we will transition over to the panel discussion part of this evening. And at the end of the panel, we'll be taking questions from the audience here, where you can come up for the microphone, and also from the webinar, where you can type into the Q&A chat function. The panel will initially talk for around about 40 minutes in response to some prepared questions. And as we transition over, I'd like to introduce the moderator of our panel, Christine Ziegler. Christine is an accomplished nonfiction writer, nonprofit fundraising executive, and CEO of Planet Women, a global environmental conservation, leadership, and equity organization. Christine also very generously serves on the IIC advisory board. Thanks. Christine, for partnering us with this event and also for putting together such a tremendous panel. And over to you. Thank you so much, John. And I'm so thrilled to be with you all tonight. Exploration belongs to us all. We're not going to explore the planet properly unless we have the whole planet represented in that exploration. Ella's words are magnificent. I just love that. I believe in that. I want that. For all of you at the Briggs Amphitheater in Williamsburg, for all of you joining us virtually from around the globe, for all the people living on the planet right now, I want that. For all the people who are yet to come, I want that. Planet Women is a startup. It's all about putting women at the forefront of solving our most critical environmental challenges so that we have a healthy planet for everybody. Seven years ago, about this time, I passed my check ride for my private pilot license. During my training, there was always an older gentleman hanging around the flight school in the hangars who was a Vietnam era pilot. He flew F-4 Phantoms. Everyone loved talking to him because he was someone you really wanted advice from because he had great pilot skills and he was also kind. And one day I got up the courage to ask him this question. I said, is there a difference between female pilots and male pilots? And he immediately said, nope, there are bad male pilots. There are bad female pilots. There are excellent male pilots and there are excellent female pilots. And I thought, well, thank goodness. So maybe I have a chance at doing this, you know, because so few women are pilots. I had a female flight instructor and she's the reason that I was able to get my license, but she couldn't teach me everything. Like there were just some things that weren't sinking into my head. So she recruited some of her colleagues to take me up every once in a while, you know, mix things up. Sometimes I would go up with much younger male pilots who are still in college or getting their degree. Other times I'd go up with really seasoned pilots. And it's that combination of that male and female leadership energy and all the knowledge that I think has made me into a proficient and safe pilot, not one more than another. And yet when it comes to solving problems, like the problems you're gonna hear about that these amazing women are working on and focused on right now, whether it's climate change, invasive species, I don't know, saving the Amazon, saving the Congo basin, working on the intersection between social justice and the environmental leadership that we all need, there's a big group that's left out. Planet Women believes that Humanity makes the most strides when people of all backgrounds and all gender identities are tapped to solve our world's most challenging environmental problems. The problem though, is that there's a lack of balance and a lack of diversity as you look at who is solving them. 
Let's look at governments, 94% of all governments led by men. Let's look at Fortune 500 companies. There are more women than ever on that list, but 93% are still men. 74% of our senators here in the United States are men. 94% uh, of the pilots that I fly with um, are men. And I gotta say, I have not really experienced much discrimination, although I do fly with my husband and he's on the right seat, which is where you fly if you're not the pilot in command. And when we get out of the airplane, typically people will come up to him and say, oh, what kind of plane is your plane? Or, you know, where'd you fly in from? And he'll say, I don't know, ask her. So as we look at how to balance these teams that are tackling these enormously complex problems that governments and charities and businesses all must focus on, we know that women need to get to the top of organizations, but they're not getting there. Why? Why aren't they getting there? Well, there's some who say there's still a bias against female leadership, or perhaps we're not applying, we're not putting ourselves out there, could be a combination of those and many other factors. But my friends, I think we're on the brink of something very exciting because of the pandemic, because of the upcoming election, because of the protests, because of all of the things that we are identifying as not working out so great for the planet. We know we need courageous women leaders to step forward. Just last month, the United Nations put out a report that said of the 20 biodiversity targets that were established about a decade ago by 150 governments, those are the, the targets set in Japan, they're the targets set to, to achieve biodiversity goals. Of those 20, zero have been met by any of those, of those countries. We've met none of them. So I feel, and I know you all feel, that we're on the brink of something different. Tonight, we're joined by some trailblazing women who are showing us the way and taking strides for a more just, more inclusive, more creative, more joyful, more compassionate future. They have generously offered to share their time with all of you. And I know that for the undergraduates in the audience, you may look at us and say, oh, those are older women who figured things out. But believe me, I'm gonna be getting just as much out of this and getting enough advice to, to fortify and fill the well as well. No matter your age or generation, you always need wise counsel. You always need to hear the good work. So are you ready to be inspired? I would like to introduce our four panelists tonight. I'll start with Paulina Arroyo. She was recently promoted to the Adaptive Management and Evaluation Director for the Environment Program at the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. She's long been a leader in rights-based conservation. Um, she's been the leader on the Andes and Amazon initiative there at the foundation. And the foundation, along with all its partners and grantees through all the work over the many years, has basically contributed to the conservation of half of the Amazon biome, half. It's awesome. Welcome, Paulina. Erin Spencer, she's our William and Mary alumna, 2014, class of 2014. Really glad to have you back. I know you're not technically there on the campus, but spiritually, we are all there with you in the amphitheater. She's a marine ecologist, a science communicator, a National Geographic explorer, and she is getting her PhD right this moment at Florida International University studying sharks. And I want to hear all about sharks and, and, and what that's like to be down there with the hammerheads. Um, she's also studying the prey of the sharks, which I think is really a great dimension, as well as the whole effect of climate change on sharks, on skates, on rays. Welcome to you, Erin. Next up, Dr. Tara Stawinski, our primatologist and president, CEO, and chief scientific officer of an organization I know we have all heard of and love and admire, and that's the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International, which is dedicated to the study, the conservation, and the protection of gorillas. She just got back from Rwanda, and her team and her supporters are building this awesome campus where they're going to be training the next generation of conservationists, located right there in Volcanoes National Park, where the people and the gorillas live. Welcome to you, Tara. And last, Christine Wilkinson, 
conservation biologist and educator and another National Geographic Explorer. She is also a PhD candidate at the University of California here at Berkeley. Um, I'm also on the West Coast with Paulina and, uh, and Christine. And she's studying the human wildlife conflict and impacts and interactions, but even better. And I'm just so proud and thrilled uh, to have Christine here. She's the co-founder of Black Mammologists Week, which is an event dedicated to creating a network of Black mammologists, addressing systemic racism, and developing opportunities for Black and people of color scholars in our movement. I mean, is this a woman of our times or what do we need you? We need you all. So let's get warmed up, everybody. Big breath. Whew, it's going to be so fun. The film that we all just watched, which is so excellent, uh, there's so many juicy moments there, really talks about women who were first, first in science or first to be um, in some professions like longshoremen, et cetera. These women showed us kind of like it can be done. Might be hard, but it can be done. Who is the woman that you would like to acknowledge tonight? A woman who has inspired you to take your own path. And I'll go uh, in order on my screen. Can I start with you, Christine Wilkinson? Oh, so exciting. I get the first question. Um, so it's really funny because I actually recognized several like friends and mentors in that movie, which was really fun. Um, like Laylee, who I worked with for a little while, a few summers ago. And yeah, just tons of inspiring people that I know in that film, but someone who I didn't see, um, her name is Dr. Kay Holdekamp, and she runs the longest running hyena project in the world. It's in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. And she's just a total badass. I'm allowed to say that. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Um, and she, you know, created the project herself, um, has been studying hyena behavior and anthropogenic impacts on hyenas and has learned so much about them is probably the, the foremost expert on spotted hyenas in the whole world. And she's also just a really, really fun down to earth person. And for anyone who has worked uh, through bureaucracies in conservation research, you'll know that it's really difficult to set up a brand new project and to keep that going. Um, I'm sure Tara can speak to that. And so just having Kay like as a, as a role model, both personally advising me on my projects and spotted hyenas, but also just in general as a conservationist and as a person of integrity has been really excellent for me. So that's how I want to acknowledge. Excellent. Thank you, Christine. Uh, over to you, Tara, you're next on my screen here. Great. Well, thanks so much. And, uh, you know, I think that I, I definitely have to to mention Diane Fossey um, as the person who started my organization, which is now the longest running guerrilla research and conservation site in the world. But to think that she went there in 1967 um, as a woman alone with no scientific training um, and was really on her own for a long time in terms of, you know, didn't have a lot of support from the government, um, didn't have a lot of support from local communities. And, you know, at the time, people thought of gorillas as these ferocious, scary King Kong like beasts. And she went and lived among them and got to know them as individuals and really changed how the world viewed them. And I think that that's a lot of the reason why mountain gorillas are still with us and are one of the few animals that are actually in what the only great ape that are increasing on the planet because she taught people to love them. I think that's one of her biggest legacies. So, um, and I'm thrilled to be that her, you know, she passed away in 1985, but that her organization has been able to continue on all this time and has over 210 people in Africa out every day fighting for gorillas. That's awesome. Thank you, Tara. Erin, how about you? Uh, what what woman would you like to acknowledge? Which women would you like to acknowledge tonight? Well, I would love to mention actually, again, like Christine, one of the women in the documentary, um, Dr. Sylvia Earle. It's absolutely incredible to hear her stories about truly being the first woman in a lot of these um, marine science field experiences. Um, and I had a personal experience with her as an intern um, at National Geographic when I was a sophomore at Wave and & Mary. And I knew that she was in town 
And I actually staked out her office for like an hour waiting for her to come back just to tell her how much I appreciated her work. And um, she, and it wasn't until she came back when I realized how um, kind of intrusive that strategy was to just wait in her office until she came back. But um, she spoke to me with such grace and, and treated me like I was the most important meeting that she had all day when it turns out she was en route to meet with the CEO of National Geographic. And so um, she's just truly an incredible person, not only in what she's achieved in the field of ocean conservation, but just um, a role model in action um, in one-on-one -on -one as well. So I'd like to acknowledge her. Love Sylvia. Love it. Thank you so much, Erin. And Paulina, what about you? Which, which women or woman would you like to acknowledge tonight? Well, thanks, Christine. It's really wonderful to be sharing this moment with everyone. Um, for me, it's a little bit more personal. I'd really like to recognize my my mom because I, I think she has always been sort of the the inspiration and the rock for me um, as a single mother. She was the first woman to go to university in the family. She was the first woman to leave Ecuador and move to the U.S. You know, with with a three-year-old daughter and and just sort of forge a life here and um, and still embed in me or instill in me appreciation of language and culture. Um, and so for me, that that's sort of my form, formative years that have determined what I did after that. I've had many women mentors along the way, mm -hmm. but I think because of her, I've always been more inclined to look for those female mentors, um, uh, be they, you know, uh, Latin, Latinas or, or not, it, she always instilled in me the appreciation of, of life and nature and um, being just true to myself. Wonderful. And I know it's been so hard to be separated and she's, she's hunkering down in Ecuador being safe, but um, hopefully she'll be able to watch this later and we can say, hi, mom. <laughs> we're all taking care of each other. Well, given all that we're experiencing right this second, if you're thinking about the pandemic or the upcoming election or protests or the Women's March this weekend, whew, so much happening. What is your intention for tonight? What's the intention behind your conservation work? In other words, why do you do what you do? I'll start with you, Christine Wilkinson. Um, that's a great question. And I think that I could probably go on for hours about why I'm really glad to be part of this panel tonight. Um, but I'll try to make it short. So I really believe that women, and I mean that in the broadest sense of the term, are the best leaders to give our planet a fighting chance to thrive. I really believe that. And I think, unfortunately, like along with thousands of years of pushing aside mm -hmm. women's opinions and suppressing their leadership, Many patriarchal societies have also taught men and boys that they should suppress their emotions and their empathy. And I really think this empathy gap is a huge contributor to our major conservation challenges. So I think like for now at least, and, and this is luckily starting to, to change over time, women have the advantage in the empathy department and we need to be lifting up and supporting women leaders of all backgrounds to be conservation leaders. So I hope that me being here today can serve as just like a small piece of inspiration toward this end um, for folks who are watching or women who are watching and, and um, wanna see some folks who look like them up here. Beautiful, beautifully said. Tara, how about you? What's your intention for tonight and your, your work? Mm -hmm. Christine, that was lovely. That's a hard act to follow. Um, I would say that, um, you know, I just, I, I got into this field because I loved animals and wanted to work with animals. But the longer I've been in it, the further away I am from, from the animals themselves. I don't get to spend time watching gorillas anymore. I, I have a lot of other responsibilities, but I just believe that I want to leave this planet a better place, hopefully, than when I joined it. And I have two young daughters and I wanna make sure that gorillas and hyenas and elephants and all of these wonderful animals that so inspired me as a child are still around when my daughters are, are my age. And so um, 
it means that I spend a lot of time away from my family. Uh, it's, it's a difficult job. It's, it's 24 seven. I mean, I think I eat, breathe and, and sleep what I do, but I just feel that I feel very honored to be in this position to hopefully make a difference and do something good for the planet and be a role model to my daughters and other girls as well and other women as well who are interested in this field. Awesome. I hope they get a chance to watch this later. Erin, <laughs> how about you? These are all wonderful and, and I, my intention for tonight is when we're thinking about careers in conservation, you know, many of us on this panel are very lucky that we get to work with charismatic animals and charismatic places and I, I think that where I'd really like to move is thinking about instead of a career in conservation, it's how can all careers contribute to conservation? You know, whether we work in um, the business sector, or the nonprofit sector, I mean, every job should have this element of conservation because that, I mean, we're at this place in our planet that we all need to be applying all of our efforts and all of our skills to this idea of conservation. So I think part of what I really am trying to do personally and, and throughout my work is, is recalibrating what my idea of um, the field of conservation is because it really should be applicable across disciplines. Oh my gosh, you are all saying such good stuff. Um, recalibrating the field, love it. Thank you so much, Erin. Paulina. Well, um, I could just say ditto to all of that because that's exactly uh, what I was thinking. Um, but I would build on what Erin says that to me, my intent is always to, um, one, to build bridges Ever, early on in my career, I was always trying to build a bridge of dialogue between like rural communities, indigenous communities and the conservation sector when at a time those were not in dialogue. Uh, and, and now I still, even being at the foundation, the Moore Foundation, I feel that I'm still always building bridges between organizations to work together. Like we need to find and, and build bridges for alliances because we can't work in isolation anymore. The problems are usually much bigger than any one single organization or individual can, can face. So building those bridges and then inspiring others independent of where you work. You, to be a conservationist now, you don't necessarily have to be a biologist. I'm not a biologist um, and I've sort of forged my career in this and uh, working more from the social sciences and working with people. So I, I, I agree with Aaron. I think we need to inspire everybody, no matter what your career is, no matter where you are, to be able to contribute to um, resetting our relationship with nature and, and, and having a, a balance. Well said, well said. Yeah, I'm not a biologist either, um, but I try to translate all the good science that's done in, in our institutions into stories and so you can see how marketing and storytelling and writing are also part of this so the humanities science it all works together it's um it's a wonderful career well speaking of careers i want to hear what was your first paying job christine really short answer uh, my first paying job was driving a golf cart around a golf course and selling snacks and making people hot dogs. And I, and, you know, since we're on the subject of, of women and patriarchy, often people were offering me their, you know, 18 year old sons as my boyfriend. Uh, and I was like, I'll take a tip in money only. Thank you. In lieu of that cash would be appreciated. Thank you for sharing Christine. Aaron, what was your first job? My first job was cleaning tack at a horse farm, you know, with like leather therapy and buffing things out. And I don't use that skill very much anymore, but I do have this one pair of leather boots that I wear in the fall and they look immaculate. Comes in handy. <laughs> Tara, how about you? What was your first paying job? My first paying job, I'm pretty sure was babysitting. I did that, you know, all in all through high school and even in college, did a lot of babysitting, a lot of time with kids, which Likewise. hopefully made me a, a good observer of behavior. <laughs> Great, Paulina. So um, I grew up in Alexandria, Virginia. So my first paying job in high school was to work in an old age home, like the cafeteria. Um, 
But to me, that was one way of just appreciating elders. And I loved listening to their stories. And even when I would just take them a meal to their room when they were too, too frail to come to the dining room, they just were desperate to talk to someone and to tell their stories. So that's always sort of stayed with me for a long time when I, any of the work I do with with um, communities like in the Amazon, I always go first to the elders to, to hear their stories and, and what they're thinking. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous. And I'm sure they loved you being there because of your difference in age and the appreciation for the energy that you brought. Um, Christine, tell us about your first conservation job or your first sort of uh, tipping, dipping your toes into getting paid to do your dream job. Um, that's a, a good question. So it's interesting because uh, a lot of my like getting paid to do the dream things were like NSF fellowships and that kind of thing. I don't know if that counts, but I'll sure. go for it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically, um, you know, similar to, to Ray, who you saw in the film, I kind of grew up in Queens, New York, uh, watching these like nature shows with these white guys talking, right? And I was like, I really want to be like them, but I don't know how to be like them. Um, and I was like running around trying to catch cockroaches and squirrels and cicadas. And I like had no idea how to translate that into a career like, at all. Um, but I was really lucky that when I applied to Cornell for my undergrad, um, a woman named Dr. Myra Shulman reached out to me from Cornell and said there was an NSF um, funded opportunity for uh, basically to increase diversity in the sciences where I would go to this place called Shoals Marine Laboratory. It's an island off the coast of Maine and um, do science essentially and, and get paid wow. stipend to do it. So for every summer, I went back to Shoals and did various research, mostly on seabirds. Um, so I guess that's my first paid experience. But then like my first real like independent experience in conservation was after I graduated from undergrad I went and worked as the assistant manager of the Kasokwa Forest Project in Uganda, near Masindi, Uganda. Um, and essentially they, there's a very small forest fragment called Kasokwa Forest, and there are chimps in there and baboons and colobus and some other species. Mm -hmm. And essentially uh, monitoring the chimps, working with the field assistants who are, uh, worked for the project for a long time and teaching them some new techniques for monitoring and then also piloting some um, kind of education, hands-on education programs for people who live around the forest but don't know much about the primates that are in there. So I worked there and lived there for a year after college. Awesome. Ooh, those both sound amazing. How about you, Erin, your first paid conservation gig? So I think I'll also go with a, a grant. Um, so I, my first grant to do any sort of research was partially funded through Women Mary in the Monroe Scholars Program and partially funded through National Geographic. And that grant, I almost didn't apply for, but it was actually a professor at Women Mary, Dr. Anne Marie Stock, that was like, well, you'll never get it if you don't apply for it. And why not you? And that was, I looked at that as such a pivotal moment where I, I was just never going to even put myself up for that opportunity without her encouragement, think like counting myself out of the race before I got there. So um, I studied invasive lionfish in the Florida Keys and looking at um, how people change their behavior to um, fight back essentially against this invasive species. And so I spent the summer in the Keys and it was really an exercise in just doing field work. I completely mismanaged my budget and spent all my money on diving. So I ended up eating lionfish for most of the grant, which, you know, we were hunting them anyway. And so I ended up eating them and it was a, but now I'm much more judicious about my, my grant money, but um, it was just a wonderful experience and made me feel like I, this is something I could actually pursue um, as a career, so. And you proved you could live off lionfish. So that was useful. Yeah, I can tell you 100 recipes for the <laughs> ways to eat lionfish. <laughs> Excellent. I will keep that in mind. Paulina, how about you? First, first gig. Um, well, yeah, after graduating from University of Waterloo, Waterloo and Bachelor's of Environmental Studies, wasn't really quite sure what I could do. Um, but I, my interest was definitely working with uh, communities and natural resources management. So I went to Ecuador where I hadn't 
live there. I was born there, but I, I had never actually lived there um, or studied there or anything. And in fact, my Spanish was not very good. Um, and so when I got there, my intent was to volunteer in any project that would just take me as long as I would learn about working in, in um, tropical areas and, and working in conservation. And within a month after meeting a few people, I was offered a, like a full-time job. And I thought, my God, you're gonna pay me to do this? <laughs> so I'll work for free. But it was a wonderful experience in uh, Fundación Natura. It was at that time the largest environmental NGO, uh, the almost only environmental NGO in Ecuador, and um, had opportunity to really just learn so much from working with rural communities, park rangers, um, the government, and, and always being almost the only woman almost every time in, in most of the settings. Um, and certainly the, the only um, you know, woman coming into the rural areas as a professional. And, and so that, that was always a bit of a challenge too with, with some of the community organizations that were usually the, the male um, president and so forth. So you had to find mm -hmm. ways to, to, or different strategies to be able to talk to, to the women in the communities. Um, so that was my, my first kind of paying job. And, and they, what they basically said, well, we need somebody to write the reports for the donor and nobody speaks English. So here, <laughs> and that was it. I stayed for 18 years working in, in Ecuador wow. after that. Phenomenal. Now you're on the other side, getting reports from grantees. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paulina. Tara, how about you? Well, I, um was originally going to be a vet. That's what I wanted to do. I had known from an early age that I wanted to work with animals and I was accepted to vet school and I went and did my master's in the UK in biology. And I finished a little bit early and I said, well, I'm halfway to Africa. I've always wanted to go to Africa. Um, I'm gonna try and do that. And I'm gonna age myself here by saying that I, there was no email at the time. So I wrote about a hundred letters to people in the field saying, can I come and be a field assistant? I really just want to get some experience on the ground. And I heard back from exactly two people, probably my letters didn't make it to most folks. Um, and they didn't have opportunities, but then I was able to find a graduate student and I went to Zimbabwe to study side striped jackals. Um, and I just Ooh. completely fell in love with being in Zimbabwe with the work. I never saw a jackal. They were nocturnal where they had radio collars on. We just sort of followed them around to, to get an idea of, of where they ranged. And, um, but I fell in love with it and it, it changed my trajectory. I came back and decided I wasn't going to do veterinary medicine and applied uh, to do a PhD in animal behavior instead. So it was very transformational for me. I remember the days before email too. <laughs> Yep. It was it was a very different place to be. And I can remember the first email I ever sent on campus when I was an undergrad. And I didn't realize that people could tell who it was from. So I sent it to this guy I had a crush on <laughs> thinking it was anonymous. Boy, I did not understand the technology. <laughs> okay, and on to um, kind of the, the theme of tonight, which is the empowerment of women why is this important? Why is women's empowerment or more women leading or more women running projects important to you? Can I start with you, Christine Wilkinson? Sure. Um, again, so many answers for this, but you know, there are so many subtle and not so subtle ways that women are pushed out of or excluded from conservation and out of STEM fields more broadly. Mm -hmm. And you know, specifically where I work, um, currently I work in Kenya. I don't think I said that. So I work in Kenya right now in and around Lake Nakuru National Park um, with communities there and also on carnivore movement through developed landscapes and carnivore conflict with people. Um, and so in many of the places where I work, women are expected to be the family caretakers and that can leave a little, very little time for conservation work um, historically. And I think that's really changing a lot, which is amazing to see as you saw in the, in the film but since part of my work involves community participatory mapping, so having people kind of draw on maps their experiences with carnivore conflict and their um, you know, desired outcomes for conservation where they live, um, kind of spatially explicit experiences, um, I've put in place some 
kind of active strategies to make sure that women's voices are heard in that process um, and that the, it, the issues they're facing are elevated to the top as much as the men in the community. So just, you know, one of example, it's a really simple fix is having men and women come on separate days for the participatory mapping. Um, and when, you know, when you do kind of the, the co-ed uh, participatory mapping instead, you can see a huge difference. Like when men or women are together, women are just, for the most part, are just quiet and men will just take over. Um, and that's just because, you know, even we live in a patriarchal society here. So we know how that is it, and it's just less subtle where I work. Um, and so separating men and women so that women can really feel free to speak more freely without this kind of overshadowing presence of men. Um, and so I guess what I'm getting at is I think that there are a lot of, it's a complicated issue, how to empower women uh, you know, in this field and also in field work. But I think that we can get really creative and make even relatively small logistical fixes that can make a huge difference when thinking about empowering women in this field and um, creating these conservation leaders you know, kind of from the ground up. Um, so that's how I'll answer that. Great, thank you, Christine. Erin, what about you? Why is, this, why is this so important to you? I think it's very interesting to be in this current cohort of folks like in the early career stage going into conservation because most of my colleagues are women. Most of the people in my program in my PhD and in my master's were all women. Um, a lot of my classes at, in my undergrad were a lot, a lot of women, but then when you look at these kind of senior leadership positions in a lot of organizations, it, that proportion is very different and there's a lot more men dominating those spaces. And um, there's been a lot of conversation um, recently and I'm sure for a long time, but I think more in the spotlight recently about you know, this pipeline of people being lost between, you know, what happens when 75% of the folks that I'm with now are women, but that's not being reflected later on. And so identifying where in that process people, women are being cut out of those spaces. And it's not just women. I mean, it's people of all different races and, and identities. And so where is that happening and how can we, we prevent that? And, and I think the more people share their stories and feel comfortable coming forward with their own experiences, it identifies uh, where those gaps are and kind of where those fixes need to be. Um, and I, you know, when I look at my generation, um, I'm just really excited to see where we all go next because I just, I just can't believe that the enthusiasm and the passion that I see um, and the support that we're getting um, more so now um, isn't gonna translate to, to a better um, distribution of or a better ratio, I think, of people in leadership soon. Love it, love it. And I, I've always heard, but maybe this is changing, that people who work on sharks tend to be male. Is, are you seeing that proportion changing as well? Uh, well, in my lab, there's 13 of us, I think, who are, who are undergrads. I'm sorry, undergrads, I'm a PhD student. Um, uh, who are in the grad in the graduate program in my lab, and I think eleven of us are women. Um, so I think there's a ton of women in shark science, and it's really exciting to see. And there's also been a ton of conversations in our professional organizations around sharks and elasmobranchs of um, making sure it's a really inclusive space. Um, because I think, uh, just to speak from a marine science standpoint, and I'm I'm sure this probably applies across many standpoints a lot of field-based research has historically um, been tough for women and not as inclusive. And so there's a lot of conversation about when you're in these remote field sites and uh, away from home, um, how can we make that space a lot more um, accommodating for everyone, so. Thank you so much. Paulina, why is this important to you? I know you do a lot of work on women and leadership up and down the Americas. Well, this, this has always been something I've been very passionate about ever since um, even undergraduate work and, and so forth. And I think now being a mother, you know, once you become a mother, you have like this chip also that activates suddenly inside of you that you want to do everything uh, to protect your cubs and, and make the world better for them. So it. It, it, I think that's a driving force um, when I had my daughter and, and, and now with 
who have two two daughters through with my second with my second husband. So for me, it's seeing women who have always been change makers in in the communities I've worked with. Um, a, a story similar to Christine doing community mapping, and we wanted to get the the women's perspective on on that. But we had to either do separate focal groups with men and women to get be able to get their input, because in in the shared spaces, women usually didn't speak, or in many cases uh, where we were working, many women didn't even speak Spanish. So um, the, there's always that language barrier too. But but I remember in this one case, working in this one community, we went to the president's house. Um, because we wanted to first get permission to even go to the community and be able to, to start working on with the project. And uh, we needed to get his permission as the official president. And so we were doing a, the initial community map with him and his wife was invited us in and, and she was making coffee for us in the kitchen. Um, but as he was sort of drawing on the map and explaining where things was, she kept yelling from the kitchen, no, that's not right. No, that's not, you're not saying that correctly. And, and so finally she you know, was able to incorporate and I gave her kind of the pen. It's like, well, why don't you tell us where things are? And she's like, yeah, yeah, okay. So in the end, we were able to have this really wonderful conversation with both the president and, and his wife, but just sort of seeing how much knowledge she had in a different perspective of just even their physical surroundings in the community and where the certain resources were. Um, to, to me, that was enlightening. That was very early on in my career. So I've seen those sort of cases in, you know, kind of this popcorn all over uh, the regions and the places I've worked in, in the Amazon region in South America through projects or directly or, or the projects that we support. So I, I truly feel that that is to me, the driving force of, of future change. It doesn't mean that all that change is on women's shoulders. So I, I also want to make sure that it's not only our responsibility to resolve the problems we're in right now, but we've, we've got to find those uh, male allies and other al alliances. Uh, so going back to my comment on building bridges, like we really do need to put this in, in a community sense, otherwise, it's, it's too much just to have it all on women's shoulders, but uh, definitely women are the ones who are gonna be forging uh, forward the solutions. Well said, well said, thank you for that. Tara, how about you? How does, how does this manifest uh, in, your, in your mind and your experience? Yeah, well, I think being in primatology, I have been extremely lucky because I had amazing female role models in between Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall and Barute Galdicus. I mean, the field of ape study was really led by women. Um, so it was kind of easy to see a path forward. But what I wanna do is make sure that I'm creating those opportunities, particularly for my African colleagues and making sure that we are promoting women in science in, in Africa. And we're very proud of the fact that half of our scientists that we have on our team are women. Um, and also I think when we, we work a lot with local communities and we know that women are actually, the, uh, you know, they control a lot of what's happening in the house, they make decisions about what families are eating. Um, and so when we bring them along and they're part of conservation and we provide them with opportunities, then they can really make a difference for conservation. And you mentioned when you introduced me that we're building um, a campus, we're building a research center in Africa. And we have committed that 35% of the construction workforce will be female and 35% of the leadership positions across the whole project will be female. And while I was in Rwanda a few weeks ago, I went to the women's association that they have formed, the female construction workers, and seeing how empowered they were by having a job and making money and being independent and then being able to make decisions for their family and be ambassadors for conservation by working on this project, it just really um, reiterated the importance of making sure that women in local communities are, are at the table when we're talking about conservation. Awesome, awesome. I love that having a kind of a set percentage. It's a great idea. I wanna switch a little bit into what are some of the challenges that you personally have encountered um, and then ask that you consider some advice you'd offer to our students who are in the audience tonight who hopefully are like, I totally wanna to do what they're doing, how do I do it? 
Um, so things that you've encountered as challenges and then advice to our undergraduates who might be considering an adventure like this for their own life. Uh, I'll start with you, Christine. Yeah, I mean, I guess the biggest challenge for me, especially since, you know, as, as Aaron said, like we're in that part of the pipeline where there's still a lot of women. Um, I'm a PhD student as well. Um, and so I haven't felt so much, you know, I've been kind of blessed to, to be able to be in this cohort where it's so full of women in this in conservation right now compared to the past. So the biggest challenge for me is actually more, um, more about field work. Um, and Erin also mentioned this. Um, I do most of my work alone, often at night, because I work on nocturnal animals. Um, and I'm a pretty independent person. I've always been that way since I was a kid. Um, and so it's really quite vexing to have to worry about my personal safety um, during field work in ways that men don't really have to think about. So uh, overcoming that, which is, you know, way down the road for some folks who are just getting started, but it just means kind of having a plan in place. Um, I think it's, it's more difficult when you're starting your own project, which is what I have done. Um, but often there are pro existing projects that you're tapping into and you can do kind of the legwork to be like, okay, what, what is your safety plan here? Like ask the people in charge um, what the safety plans are and you know, what kinds of trainings people are getting on um, bias and microaggressions and things like that. Um, for me, since I'm on my own project, I kind of bring the tools that I can to make me feel prepared for dangerous situations. So like I bring like weaponry and things, um, but that's just, it's just the truth. Um, and you know, I kind of make the hard choices about who I choose to be with after dark. Um, and sometimes you are on your own like that and you have to kind of make those choices and also be tender with yourself if you don't feel courageous enough, like let yourself not do that um, and, and make those choices, which can be difficult. Um, and then as far as like how folks can can do this work um, and also do this work in a more inclusive way. I, I would say uh, it's come up in our conversation already, but take advantage of opportunities. Don't be afraid to cold email people. Um, don't be afraid to reach out to people who look like you or who are role models for you. And the worst thing that can happen is that they won't respond. Like that's really the worst that can happen. Um, almost every single thing that I have done has been from taking opportunities. Um, as a matter of fact, my first job that I spoke to you about, Kasokwa Forest Project, um, came from where I actually met Erica, who planned this event, um, was my study abroad with School for Field Studies in Kenya and Tanzania during my junior year of undergrad. One of the professors actually is the um, founder of that project, and I had stayed in touch with her. And then after I graduated, I was like, all right, I'm going to come work on your project. And she was like, excellent, we need someone. Um, and that's how that happened. Like, it wouldn't have happened otherwise without just like kind of putting myself out there. Um, and as far as kind of, you know, thinking about being inclusive and, and kind of building up yourself and others, if you're from an historically min minoritized group, um, I would say what we really need to do is know that women and people of color who are doing this work are out here. I mean, you see some of us right here in front of you and there are more and more of us out here doing conservation work. Um, so the field is changing really quickly. We're here for you. Don't be afraid to reach out. Um, we need to all at the same time, make sure we all lift each other up with us. So when you're rising, don't just rise, bring someone with you on the way up. Um, mm -hmm. In your work, you can think deeply about how you can support and elevate you know, your undergraduate students, your mentees, your field team, the community members that you know, and bring those people up with you as conservation leaders. So don't, um, don't just leave them there or, or don't just kind of do research on people, do research with people um, and hold yourself to goals around that. Um, and I guess the last thing I wanna say on this is I really, really want us to get to the point where we're no longer trying to be the first female or the first black carnivore ecologist. I want those roads to already be paved with so many inspirational leaders that have come before and I think it's already happening, so. See, I told you we were all gonna be inspired. Woo! So good, thank you, Christine. Erin, how about you? What are you thinking in terms of advice you'd give, but also maybe some challenges or barriers you've encountered? What a tough act to follow. I really love, Christine, talking about pulling people as you rise. I mean, I, I felt like I needed, you know, in order to help someone, you need to be like super well established in your career and have been doing this for decades. And even something as simple as, as 
giving advice to someone who's a year younger than you or go, trying to go through the application process to something you've already done. Um, but, I, but I do wanna to touch on, unfortunately, I, I have a similar story to Christine about some of the challenges we've encountered in the field. One of the things I love most about what I do is I get to go to these beautiful, very remote places. But unfortunately, that can sometimes mean that you feel very isolated and vulnerable. And so um, I have been in instances where I am one of the few women and especially one of the youngest where I've experienced harassment and, and situations that make me feel very um, isolated. And so I think that's unfortunately something that has come up quite a bit in the field of marine science. And, and there was also a really wonderful piece written in Scientific American recently, specifically about shark science. You know, a lot, you know when you're on, you're on a boat, like I've been on a boat for two weeks with six people where we don't get off the boat. I mean, and I think one of the main things I've learned from that is to just never question why I'm there. I mean, it can really make you feel like it is the only reason I'm here for something else, but no, it's, you know your abilities and you know what you've done to get to this point and you deserve to be there and no one has the right to make you feel otherwise. Um, and I think it has really made me um, think carefully and ask hard questions about who I collaborate with. I mean, when I was interviewing for my master's and interviewing for my PhD, I asked questions about how do you make sure that your students feel safe in the field and what are the measures that you take about that? And it was really telling because some people didn't were like, oh, I, it's not something I've thought about before. And I was like, well, that's not good. You know, you should always be thinking anyone that's in the field, you should be thinking about their safety. And so I also always try to be that person that um, not to be afraid to bring that up with my other collaborators and, and other younger folks in the field as well. Um, so as far as advice on a much happier note, I guess, um, one thing that I would say is definitely um, do not let no be the end when it comes to seeking opportunities. I mean, I one of my grants that took me to Fiji for um, a couple months to do this incredible research, I had to apply and get rejected for that grant, you know, four or five times before it was finally funded. But when you do that final presentation, no one knows that it was rejected five times. So it just not letting that, not letting rejections um, define you and make you think like you're not fit for this field. It's actually part of the field. You're gonna apply and get rejected to a lot of things. So just keep applying. Great advice. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, we are now going to go to our audience for questions. So I apologize to Tara and Paulina um, for not being able to give you some time to give advice. But uh, anyone who's here tonight, I know you can reach out to these women for ideas, support, love. Uh, don't do this, do that, you know, all of that. Um, we'll start with questions from the webinar audience. And I love this question, which is, how can we create mentorship and kinship programs that lift, that create more lift for women? Um, and does this proverb have any relevance? If you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. Um, I know that many of you have worked in Africa, but I'll start with you, Tara, since you most recently just came back from there uh, in your adventure to Rwanda. But how can we create some programs to raise each other up? I think it's I think it's an you know something that we have to be very thoughtful about and um, cognizant that that some people, you know, that opportunities are not equally available and how, and be really active and think about it. I mean, we work very hard. I mean, a lot of our work is focused on training the next generation of African conservationists. And it's an area that I think um, we've spent a lot of time being very purposeful for, uh, developing programs, finding funding for those programs, and making sure that those programs are not things that are what we do, um, you know, in addition to our work, but it is an integral part of our work. Uh, uh, you know, our work is to save gorillas and part of saving gorillas is making sure that people on the ground have the skill sets that they need to do it. So it has to be purposeful. Um, I think it has to be intentional. And I think we have to work together. This is a, an area where collaboration can make such a difference. We can't go it alone. We, the, the challenges we're facing on the ground 
are too big. And so creating these networks where, where you can introduce people. So much, I think, of the conservation world is getting introduced. You meet someone and they mm. say, well, I can't help you with that, but let me introduce you to my colleague that I know is working on that. And really creating those type of networks, I think, is incredibly important to helping people move forward and, and succeed. Awesome. Thank you, Tara. Paulina, you're involved in some networks. Can you share some thoughts about which ones have worked and, and where you see some room for improvement or ideas you might have? 